Starting to plan, you know, why our wives are focused on making the house look good and decorating and all that stuff in between getting the trees out and doing what she says. How many of you all know we, we have to make plans? We have to make plans. That's unique to men. That is a unique thing. You see it in Scripture. You see it in the very character of God and how He wired us. And that's really what I want to talk about as we close out uh, really 2024 with our very last uh, Forge Men's Breakfast. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. I know that your time is incredibly valuable, especially on a Saturday morning. I will just say up front, um, I believe because this is the last breakfast of the year, I'm just not going to rush what God wants to say to you because I believe he has something for you. With that said, I know that many of you guys, you plan. And so for some reason, uh, we start to kind of dip into the, you know, what do they call it in sports? Overtime. Come on, if we go OT two or three times, uh, don't feel bad getting up and going. Uh, we'll make sure that we get you everything that you miss. We're recording everything. We'll get that to you. Don't, don't, uh, don't feel worried about that at all. But I, I really do believe that um, God wants to speak to you. Um, I don't believe it's just for this last year. How many of you know November and December, it's a good time if you haven't taken it to get some space to be able to process how the year went, you know, some things you could do better, some things that you're looking out. But I believe God wants to actually prepare us for the new year. I don't know if you've thought about 2024. Some of you, you probably have just like, I don't even want to go there. It is going to be a wild and crazy year in culture. It's going to be a wild and crazy year, uh, really in general. And I believe that in times like this, God always wants to do something big in his people. You see this all the time in scripture. And one of the things I um, like to do is I like to get away in November and December and just spend time with pastors and mentors in my life. Uh, many of these are people who are all over the body of Christ, all over the country. Some of them I've walked with for nearly 30 years. Uh, one of them led me to Christ. I spend time with him every single November and December. We also hunt. How many of y'all got some hunting in? Anybody get some good whitetails? I, have, I, 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 I haven't gotten too many pictures. Y'all need to get out and hunt. Okay, come on. Kill some stuff. If you don't want to do a whitetail, kill a rabbit or a raccoon or something. Do us all a favor. Come on. But um, I get around and hunt, and I spend time with leaders and, and different people and and I, I recently did that, and I, I was kind of reflecting and talking with some of the pastors about what God's doing in their churches. And can I just tell you that as the things around us get darker, God's light shines brighter. It's unbelievable. Can I just tell you, sometimes, especially as men with a culture that just constantly hates on us, constantly pushes us down. By the way, we're not going to have any of that here. It's a safe place for you to be who you are, how God made you, and also even some of those sins that you need to... You need to take off, you know, you need to work on. This is a safe place for that. Uh, but in a world where sometimes we can kind of feel ostracized, we can kind of sometimes feel, you know, like everything's crumbling all around us, you know, it was really encouraging for me hearing the stories of these pastors in these great churches where God's doing something big. God's doing something big. God's always moving. Can I just, I'm going to tell you something about God if you've never thought about this. He's a winner. Amen. How many of y'all like to win? Amen. By the way, if, if you're losing, it's not because of God. It's just not, I know that's hard to say, but it's true. God's a winner. And when we put our life under his word, when we lean into him, regardless of what's going on around us, you might remember the words of Joshua at the end of his life. He's talking to all of God's people. They had just gone into the promised land. God did incredible things. He's giving them the prize. They're going to be able to rest and be prosperous. And in his very, very last speech, he's an old man at the time. He looks at them. And he reviews all of the things God told them to do. God said, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you won't. If you do this, you'll be able to enjoy the land for generations, forever. The moment you turn away from me, everything that you've gained will be lost. And I love what Joshua says at the end of this. It's, it's so good because I believe this is the spirit. This is the word of God for every single head of household. Joshua then took himself out of the culture, out of the assembly, and he makes this declaration to the people of God. He says, I just want all of you to know, I'm paraphrasing, it's from sec the book of Second Hesitations, okay, come on, give me some latitude. I don't care what y'all do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. A lot of times we want to look at culture and we want to say, oh, all this stuff is wagging, wagging fingers, you know, I know you guys, I know, I know the podcasts you listen to, because I listen to them too. I know, I know the books you read, don't get me wrong, come on, you conspiracy theorists, I, I see you, I see you. I've seen you all in some of the chat rooms, I don't think they call that anymore, but, but I've seen you in some, some of the comments. We get so wrapped up in everything going on. Here's what the Lord spoke to me while I was at a hunting ridge. 
taking my first ever bighorn sheep. Come on. It was powerful. But, but I'm going to tell you what was better than that. The Lord reminded me that everything he wants to do in culture first starts with me. Did you know everything God wants to do around you first starts in you? We see this when you give your life to Christ. The Bible says that that spirit in you that was dead, unable to connect with God. You couldn't get out of the prison of sin, Paul says in Galatians. All of a sudden you give your life to Christ. Your spirit is reborn. You're now a new creation. Right? You can now connect with God. It's this renewal. It's this, it happens from the inside out. You can't get to God by being good, by doing all the right things, by being moral. Our culture thinks that they can have a morality without God, but how's that going for them? It's not working. Because everything starts with God from the inside out. You can't know God if you don't know Christ. You've got to walk. You've got to surrender your life to Christ. Allow him to change you. And here's the thing about being born again. And us guys, we don't like to do this, especially you older ones. You got saved a little older in your age. You don't skip any of the phases. The Bible says that you're born again into the kingdom of God. That means as a baby, you have to learn. You have to change the way you think. You have to be molded and shaped Right By the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, in the community, in the family, the ecclesia of the local church. Without those, you can never fully develop. And that's really what this is all about. That's what I, that's, that's what I believe the next year is. This reminder right, that God has not put your destiny in anyone else's hands but his and yours. And it's what you do. It's what you do wherever you are. And some of you younger people, you're sitting here, yeah, but you, don't, you know, I got started rough. I came from the wrong side of the tracks. I don't have what that person has. Here's what I would challenge you to do. Stop looking over the fence at somebody else's green grass and water your own. Amen. Focus on your own. God loves you. Bible says he's no respecter of persons. Race, no respecter. You know what that means? God actually doesn't care about your race. You didn't pick it. God doesn't even care about your socioeconomic background or the parent that you were born to. You didn't pick those. What God does care about is the decisions you make to either walk towards him or away from him. Those will define what I believe could be the greatest year of your life. I, that's what I'm believing God for. I'm going to tell you right now, I, we've had some ups and downs, but I'll be honest. I look back, and I had a chance to do this this weekend. I want to challenge you to do that, especially if you followed Christ for a long time. If you haven't, you don't know anything. You just need to keep walking. But if you're older and you're kind of you're wondering, oh, man, this is just so bad, remember who you were before Christ. I started remembering. I started remembering where God took me. I started recounting the testimony of being miraculously adopted by a family in the church. I was a bus kid that gave his life to Christ. I started walking through all of the things God has done in our life. And you know, as I look out at 2024, I thought to myself, wow, God, what you couldn't do. There's nothing you couldn't do if I just, if I just keep my eyes focused on you and move forward. And that's really what I want to talk about uh, today. I want to talk about this repetition, this thing that we see in the Bible all the time. Here's the theme. It gets really, really dark, but then God, working in what's called a remnant, those people, that small number, probably a group like this, committed to following him and not giving up. Every time we see that remnant rise and every single scheme of the devil to destroy our families, our cultures, even our very lives, gets turned upside down and God moves. I believe we're on the precipice of one of those moments in our culture. I believe it's perhaps one of the first ones we've seen since perhaps the Jesus Revolution, perhaps the Great Awakening, first and second. I believe it's, it's incredible. And you see this in the Bible. You see what, what, what happens. God leads the people of Israel through Moses, almost a million people strong, to the one place that they would be trapped. Their back is against the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is coming. There were other ways to go, but that's the way God said go. You know, sometimes God will take you right to the place where your back's against the wall. You know why? Because you can't take credit for what comes next. He says, Moses, lift up your staff. The waters parted. They walked by on dry ground. The enemies were drowned behind them. For generations, even today, the children of Israel celebrate Passover. The death angel passed over. They remember all of the accounts of Moses. Moses is one of the greatest people in their culture all those thousands of years later we see daniel in the lion's den he's an old man just trying to live out his faith they say you can't pray anymore he opens up his window as he always does and prays anyways they throw him in the lion's den 
The king didn't even want to do it, but he was tricked by scheming political officials that didn't like Daniel. Daniel prayed to his God, and he was delivered. It's incredible what God does. Just read the Bible. It's over and over and over again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Bow. Worship this. Worship this image of a political leader. This image of a political system. Worship it. Put your hope and your faith in it. Bow. Three of them. Daniel was probably back at the palace. Three of them. They had all of their other countrymen. They all bowed. They, they probably said things like, well, you know what, I just, I just don't want to rock the boat. Well, you know what, I'm really not going to mean it. They look at this king whom they served. They were advisor to the king. And they said, king, I don't care what you decide to do. No matter what it is, we will never bow. The king got mad, heated up the furnace, threw him in. There was a fourth in the fire. The Bible says it looked like an angel of the Lord. The, Bible, the word of God there, at capital L-O-R-D. Anytime you see that in the Old Testament, that's called a theophany. That's a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, John said. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, before Abraham was, I am. That was the name of God. I'm the one that spoke to Abraham. I'm the one that led him. That was my voice from the bush to Moses. They picked up stones to stone him because he literally said he was God. What happens? God delivers them. The Bible says that's what that word was. Christ literally was in that furnace. You know, sometimes God delivers us from prior men. Sometimes he delivers us in it. And, and we want to avoid it, but, but our greatest purpose, our greatest contribution to those around us is sometimes just letting other people watch us burn. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it happens. You see David and Goliath. You guys know that story. You see Joseph. You know, sometimes it's not as one moment. Sometimes there's 10 bad things that happen so that one glorious thing that could have never happened without those 10 things can come forth. That's Joseph. 17 years, he goes through a process of constantly being, rising to the top, being lied about, being trashed on, being thrown out, until one day he literally saves an entire nation. None of us would be worshiping Christ had Joseph not saved the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through which the Messiah would come. Over and over again, you see it. Jesus, crucifixion, the resurrection, the devil thought he won. Man, he was pumped. He was gloating. And then the third day came. The word of God says that if Satan would have known the plan of God, which the Bible says was hidden in the mind of God, so that he wouldn't, he never would have crucified Christ. Do you know why Satan hates the Jewish people right now? He's always hated them. You know why he hates them even more now? Because of Jesus. I, I don't know if you've thought about this. Jesus isn't a Christian. He's, he's a conquering Jewish king and rabbi. The Bible says that you and I are grafted into Abraham's covenant. Before you start mouthing off about the Jewish people whom God still has a plan for, you might just remember that it's through the blood, the shed blood of Christ that we share in the promise of Abraham that we didn't become Christian when we got saved. We actually became Jewish. Amen. Think about that for a moment. I know some younger people, you're like, you know, Palestine, this, by the way, that was a Roman name given by an occupier. There's never been a nation there. The place was a desert before the Jews showed up in 48. A desert nobody wanted. Now all of a sudden, God in the desert. This is a picture. You know the children of Israel, a picture of what God can do in your life. Maybe it looks like a desert. Ain't like nothing living there. Have you been to a desert? I mean, it sucks. I mean, it's hot, first of all. There's sand. I mean, you go to the beach. I hate the beach. Sand just gets everywhere. I hate I, I do. I hate it. You've seen one beach, you've seen them all. If you like the beach, it's fine. There's a women's event happening next month. But anyways, come on. I love the beach because my wife's in a bikini. I'm just telling you. That's the only reason I love the beach. I don't love the beach because of the beach. That's funny. Think about that for a moment. Desert of your life. God comes in. His truth, his word, his life. All of a sudden, man, I went to Israel several years ago. Trying to get back, but COVID happened. Now they're in a war. They can cancel two trips. Man, I'm getting, I just got to get on a plane and go. It's, it's an amazing what it is, what it looks like today. It's unbelievable. There's a city. It's beautiful, green, and pastures. And that's, what, that's a picture of what God does in your life when you put him first. You know, Israel was a picture to the nations. It was a picture to the nations of what happens when you follow God and what happens when you don't. Your life is the same as a believer. We're a light to the world about what happens when you put God first, when you're honest, when you tell the truth. You know, you can tell the truth and smile. You know, you can say no and, you can say no and then thank you after. You, know, you guys know, you're from the South, you know what I'm talking about. Bless your heart, that's what that means. 
means no way, no way I'm going to do that. And you're an idiot. Bless your heart. That, that's what that means. If any Southerner ever tells you that, that's actually not a compliment. They, just, they literally just put you down in a, in a way that you could accept. God loves to take the long, the long shot. He just always does. You know why? Because when he comes through for us, none of us can take the credit. Let's be honest. You like taking the credit. I had a pastor friend of mine that was at the ranch a week before me. For some demonic reason, he was given a bigger ram. I, I, when I realized that I, I couldn't protest it, I started um, just lying and saying mine was bigger. <laughs> that wasn't true. There's was picture. There's photographical evidence. Not true. His was uglier for sure. Um, but not bigger. But not smaller. And, you know, we do that as human beings, you know. We want to feel accomplishment. But, you know, there's some things in our life that God wants to teach us. That, that if we would just do what he says, he would actually be the one that wins. He would win it on our behalf. And we're so self-reliant, you know, and I, I believe that. I'm going to teach you about some things you can do. But, but even the things I'm going to tell you you can do don't mean anything if you can't allow God to do what only he can do in your life. There are some things, can I just tell you, you're not going to change the, political, the geopolitical situation in the United States. I love you. I know you're listening to all the podcasts and stuff. And keep being informed. Know what's going on. Exercise your right to vote. That's important. Okay, but, but I'm just going to tell you, there's some things in the world that you're not going to solve, but you know what you can solve? You can make your marriage better. You, you can make your church better. Have you looked around? By the way, um, all these buildings are going up. It's because all these men pay for it. It's incredible what God does. I say, hey, man, we want to do this. Let's, let's open up some space for some more people. Reach some more people. Men goes, yes. Now, I mean, you know, they, they ask their wives, you know, too. But my point is, is like you can make your community better. You can, you can change the atmosphere in your family. You can, you can by the way, I, I, I heard this, Jake. I'm glad you brought this up. I think that was from God. Some of you, are, you're like addicted to porn, and it's completely twisting your brain. You can't even enjoy having sex with your wife anymore because of the fantasy that doesn't even, that's not even real, that's gripped your imagination. God wants to break that down. He wants to break that off. He wants to deal with that. God can deal with that. You know, there's $6.8 billion, the last time I checked, dollars in the porn industry. I always tell our wives, anytime I get a chance to talk to your wives, this is what I tell them. I say, listen, you need to take your husband's purity seriously. There's 6.7, 1 billion, $1 bills bet against his purity. What do we have to do? We have to put up walls and fences. I can't even download an app on my phone. It's inconvenient. But you know what I say? I'm, I don't want to get in that trap. Constantly coming through. Take a deep breath, let the shame go away, and then change your direction. That's all the word repent means. Just change the direction. And you know, I mean that. En enough with this. Enough with this fake Christian crap. It's fake Christian crap because it's not biblical. It's not biblical. You and I, none of us get out of here without working through the limps, working through the sin, working through the issues in our life. Shame doesn't motivate in the kingdom of God. When you get your eyes focused on God, when you allow him to give you a new vision for where he wants to take you, you, that'll fall off. You won't even want to. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen without other men around you. Right? Other men that help you walk through it. We're going to talk to you about some of the things we're doing for you. Really for all of us, quite frankly, in this new year to help us be strong. You know, I was, um, I was uh, at this ranch. And uh, I go a couple times a year. And I, um, I'm hunting and I'm in the lodge. And there's a young man that had been there for the last few years. He kind of helps around. You can tell he's got a job and he's a hard worker and he's just a great kid. His name's Jack. And uh, I was sitting at the table and Jack, just a moment where there was nobody else around and Jack walks over and he sits down next to me and he starts talking with me and he's 19 years old. So he must've been there in high school. He's been there a few years. And uh, he asked me a question that caught me off guard. He said, Stephen, he called me Pastor Stephen, but Stephen, what would you say, given everything you know now, what would you go back and say to your 19-year-old self? And I thought to myself, first of all, all of these people will be working for you one day. That's the first thing I thought. <laughs> Young person, hear me. It's a good question. And I started thinking about it. And, and then I blacked out for about 45 minutes. And then I came to... And he had like five pages of notes. The ranch manager just sitting over his shoulder like at a chair pulled up like listening to. I didn't even notice he was there. 
And I started thinking about hunger. I started thinking about, I was really convicted because I realized when I looked at this 19-year-old that I wasn't as hungry as him for the things of God, for personal growth and development. If you guys have ever been around me, some of you are all like, that's not true. But, I, but you don't compare yourself to other people. You compare yourself to yourself. I, I, I know my own, I, I, know, I know where I've come from. I know what, what's good for me. And I'm off. And I started thinking about this year. And this is one of the first scriptures I gave this young man. And I'm going to talk to you about how to be hungry uh, in 2024. Ephesians 5.15. This is what I told him. So be careful how you live. What it says. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Look what it says in 16. Make the most. Everyone say most. Make the most of every opportunity. In these evil days. I want you to hold that scripture up. This letter was written to the church at Ephesus. I've been there. I went there earlier this spring. It's right outside of uh, Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, no way in Hades I'd go back there right now. But anyways, this church was prospering. This church was blessed. I, I walked the ruins of these church buildings. And the early church got its start. It's, it was a boom. It's a boom in Ephesus. And what came after this letter which they didn't see coming, was massive persecution. Massive persecution. And sometimes we think it's bad, it's evil. It, we're, it, listen, it's bad. It's not as bad as the Roman Empire. It's getting there, but it's not that bad. This was a dark time. This was an evil time. And the Apostle Paul, I love this, he says, be careful how you live. Why would he tell you to be careful? Because it's easy not to be. It's easy to drift it's easy to lose that sparkle of growth that asks great questions like Jack did. It's easy. You have to be careful. You have, another word for careful is you have to be intentional. There is no neutral in walking with God. There's no neutral. You're either moving towards him intentionally or you, want, or you are unintentionally being pushed away from him by the devil. It's the only two options. And when you realize that, you understand what he's writing here. You have to constantly be careful about how you live. Look what he says. Don't live like fools. Look around the world. Don't live like them. But like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity, every moment, every, every situation, every chance you get. Every, there's this illusion to time. Make the most of the time. Every, every, every room you're in, you weren't there by accident. If you're following God, likely God put you there. If you're following the enemy, likely he put you there. But either way, you didn't get there without a purpose. If God puts you into a room, make the most of every single thing. I love this. For the days are evil. It's, it's, it's like he's preparing this church. And he's saying, hey, the days are evil. You need to do this even more. When there's plenty, when everything seems to be going right, when we're moving into a good direction, you know, that's where you drift. But in evil days, that won't work. In evil days, you have to be alert. You have to be careful. I was reading this psalm, Psalm 1, 1 through 3 this week. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Look what it says. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Have you guys ever been by a river? Big old, big old, huge trees. They go way up there, right when they're by the river. You, you know what I'm talking about. That's what he's saying. They'll be like those trees, constantly nourished. And it brings fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. By a show of hands, how many of you want everything you touch to be blessed? I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. God wants that for you even more than you do. Because he knows that if you're blessed, he can use those hands to bless others. That's how it works. So God wants that. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have abundance. Because if you don't have abundance, you can't share with anyone else. So here's what we see. We see a progression in Psalm 1, 1 through 3. We see a progression away from God. I want to show, I'm going to give you a step. I want you to see this because I think you can, uh, what's that rap song? Flip it and reverse it? <laughs> I know, I listen to, I know, I know, sorry. It's true. If you can know the path, you can flip it and reverse it, okay? Here's what the path is. First, Notice, you walk in the counsel of the ungodly. It starts, you start drifting towards the way the world thinks. 
man, that's a pretty good idea. You know, maybe God's word isn't true. You know, you know, maybe, you know, they're just, they're a good person. I say this all the time. Don't ever trust people who don't fear God. Especially ones who say they're a good person. Well, you know you. Without God, what would you be? Even with God, you're a work in progress. Don't trust them. You walk in the counsel of godly. Next, you stand in the path of sinners. This is the next progression. You begin to kind of walk. You're observing. You're kind of drifting towards them. Next, you know, you're sitting, or you're standing, rather, and you're, you're listening. You're, 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 you're standing. You're not moving anymore. You're allowing those things to get into your heart and your mind. And then finally, you sit in the seat of the scornful. Look at our world. You sit in the seat of the scornful. Now you're one of them. You, you're painted with their attitude. And I love this path away from God because it also shows you the path towards God. What, is it, what should you do? Walk in the counsel of the godly. Stand in the path of believers. Be around believers. <laughs> Sit in the seat of the saved and redeemed. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> This is great. Think about this. So you're sitting in the seat of the scornful. Here's the first thing you have to do. Get up. Stand up. Don't do it anymore. And then, this is important, after you stand up, repent. Turn away and walk the other direction. For you military brothers, it just means make an about face. Go the other way. I'm not going to make a mockery of that and try to do it. My wife told me, stop it. But you know that that means just go the other way. So that's how you do it. You find yourself, your life sucks. Man, listen, your life sucks. You're sitting in a ski, scornful. My boss doesn't understand me. If only I had this opportunity, that person took a job that I deserved. Think about it. I should be making just as much as him. How, I can't believe he drives a car like that. Think about it. Here's some, here's some good ones. Here's some good ones. They got what they got deceitfully. Right? Think about this. They have privilege I don't have because of the color of their skin. That's a scornful position. It's a destructive position. No matter who you are or what you look like. So what do you have to do? You have to reject it. You have to stand up. Stand up. No, mm -mm. I don't want to live this way anymore. Your life sucks. You don't have to stay there. Any more than if you grew up in a bad neighborhood, you don't have to stay there either. There's this thing called transit. You can. You stand up. And then what do you do? You turn and you start walking the other way. And you know what? It's amazing what God will do in your life. In a month. In a year. Five years. Ten years. It can happen. You can stop asking questions. You can stop learning. You can stop growing. You can stop moving forward. Romans 1, 28. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, guess what he did? He let you do whatever you want to do. He let you do whatever you wanted to do. And as a result, it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. Jesus' first and longest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses the drift of his people, the Jews, many of whom would become his disciples. This is his first and longest sermon. The law of first mention in the Bible means that anytime something's mentioned for the first time, that time is significant. It's setting. It sets the path for understanding that topic or that situation every single time. This is his first sermon. It's the longest one he ever told, the Sermon on the Mount. This is what he says in Matthew 5, 6. God blesses those who hunger. Everyone say hunger. Who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. He blesses those who have a hunger. In a nutshell, it's what we always say here. You never rise to the occasion. You always fall to the level of your... You have to be hungry. So I'm going to spend a few moments, and I'm, I think I'm going to be on time. Plus or minus 10 minutes. Probably plus 10 minutes. But, but I want to give you an, an acrostic. This is good for guys. You can kind of... Matter of fact, we'll put this on the website. We'll get this to you. Okay, hungry. I'm going to give you an acrostic that can help you Check yourself, because we're always drifting towards God or towards the devil, or we're intentionally moving towards God. Amen. That's just how it works. Some of you are young, and you're dumb, and you're running towards Satan. Well, don't worry. He'll have his way with you, and you'll, you'll, you'll make a change. It's way better going towards God. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, 
an acrostic. I think that's what it's called. Uh, first, H. H is hunger. Hunger for who? For God. Hunger for God. Psalm 38, 4. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Everyone say good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, God doesn't expect you to immediately do everything he's told you to do all at once. You know what he says? Do the first thing, and I promise you, you're going to want the next thing. Do the next thing, I promise you, you're going to want the thing after that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I know some of you love coffee. There, coffee is an acquired taste. I don't care what you say. It tastes like crap. Now I have to have it. I love it. Okay, but what happened? I acquired the taste. Do you know you acquire the taste for God? How do you acquire the taste for God? You continually, continually do what he says. You have to learn to acquire that. If you're a younger believer in here, like you have to start giving him a chance. He says take a step. And then you realize that that step is good. Then he says, take another step. For some of you, you're older, you need to reacquire your taste for God because you've forgotten what he tastes like. It's Next, understand. It's the you. Next, understand. Thank you. Can we give it up for our team for putting all this stuff together? I, I'm becoming the pastors I couldn't stand. You know, it's like midnight. I'm like thinking up a new idea and just get it to my creative team. And they always seem to make it happen and they get less sleep than I do. So thank you guys very much for that. Understand, this is all about seeking wisdom. This is all about seeking wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10, fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Look what it says. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. I want to pause here for a moment. There is a difference between material and moral. Let me say it this way. There's this table, it's material. There's your iPhone, that's material. Right? There's AI, that's material. All right, there's the seat you're sitting in, there's, that's material. There's a difference between this table and then how you should live your life. Those are two totally different things. And here's the problem, our culture has said that because we have a lot of knowledge, we're literally called the information age. That somehow we're, we're more advanced than those crazy, backwards, ancient People of the Bible. And I'll tell you this. They didn't have the material wealth we had. That's for sure. The poorest person today is still richer than the first billionaire was in terms of material wealth. Okay, but for all of the knowledge, our society has not grown morally. Look around. I mean, I literally heard an interview with Elon Musk talking about AI and saying, yeah, you know, it might end, it might end the world. But you know, I mean, if I had to choose, if I was AI and I had to choose a world with humans or without, I think it's more interesting with humans. So I'm just going to kind of sit back and see how it rolls. By the way, he's incredibly smart, but he has the maturity of a nine-year-old. He has the moral development of maybe an 11-year-old. And, and this, is, this is huge. I see this in the church. Really smart people. They know all the Bible and the doctrine and they have all the information, but they have the spiritual maturity of a five-year-old. They think in their own eyes that because they know something, right, or they have something, they know what to do with it. You see, wisdom starts with the fear of God. You know what that means? There is a God in heaven, and I am not him. That's humility. There is a God in heaven, and I'm not him. All these technocrats with their techno religion, they're all atheists trying to fill the hole of their heart. Eternity is planted in their heart, but they reject God. And so they say, because of their angst and their, their, their anxiety and their fears of death, I'm just going to become God. It's the same issue at the Tower of Babel. The same thing. Babel is where we get the word technology from. Isn't that funny? Literally. Technology from. Here's what I would say. You may have a smartphone, but that describes the phone, not you. You have to learn to use it. You have to learn... God, only, only the fear of God, meaning I'm going to stand in account and give an, I'm going to give an account to him one day, right? And then knowledge of how he works results in sound judgment. You for understand. Next, in, no excuses. Repent. I, I, I've noticed this. Hungry people constantly repent. I am a professional repenter in my house. 
professional. Ask my wife. I can count on one hand how many times she's repented about anything. (laughs) You're laughing because you're like, oh my God, I'm not alone. (laughs) But you know, the Bible does say that the man is supposed to be the head of the house, just like Christ is the head of the church. We pour our life out for them. So why don't you stop expecting them to do anything and keep pouring out your life for them? Think about that for a minute. Professional repenting. And I, 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 I'm going to go out on a limb here. You shouldn't respect people who make excuses all the time. I tell our team this constantly. If I want to know why it happened, I'll ask you. Usually, when I'm telling you how to fix it, I already know why it happened. Maybe you should ask for some advice. You know what happens when a man makes an excuse? You, you just look weak. How many of y'all just would love, you just, you just want to look weak? When you say it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of that, it's because of this, if only I had this, if only it worked out that way, if only that happened to me, if only I got, you see what I'm saying? It's weak. It's a deflection. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God. Look what it says. So that they are without excuse. Okay. There's a mindset that I want to challenge you with this year, and we're going to give you lots of resources to help you. There's what I would call a a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. Some people will call this a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Uh, You're either an American or an American't. And if you're Mexican, you're either a Mexican or a Mexican't. Most I know are Mexicans. Come on, somebody. (laughs) So, So it's all about how you frame and how you think about what you're doing, about about how you frame that situation. What if every problem in your life was a secret opportunity? That's what the Bible says it is. The Bible says he'll always leave a way of escape. He'll always, there's always something that you can't see. And if you have an abundance mindset, here's what you say. God has given me everything I need in this moment to do everything he's called me to do. What's the next thing he wants me to do? If you have a poverty mindset, a fixed mindset, or a scarcity mindset, they're all the same, people call them different things, you sit here and say, I can't do that because of X, Y, Z. I'm not capable of doing that. And I'll tell you this, the leaders that you look up to, the leaders that build great things, they're not necessarily great in every way, but they've done something great that you admire, I promise you, have a growth mindset in that area. By the way, it's possible to have a growth mindset in your job, but not your marriage. I've met lots of people, they're absolutely rich in their business and their leadership, and they're poor in their family. So this is something you constantly have to challenge yourself. Listen, 2024 will be so much better for every one of you and every single person that you lead and you cover if you don't make excuses. If you don't make excuses, you can clap for that. Remember 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater. I would say greater. Greater Greater than he that is in the world. Philippians 4.13, I can do all. I would say all. all. In the Greek, the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Latin, all means all. I can do all. I can do all things through Christ who's given me strength. Next, the G is for grow. Grow is all about doing the next right thing. I want to talk to you guys about this. Men, you're not hard enough on yourself. At the same time, you're too hard on yourself. What do I mean by that? You should hold yourself to the highest standard. If you hold yourself to a higher standard than anyone else, you will never make excuses. On the flip side, you are becoming day by day, painfully, slowly over time like Christ. Here's what I mean. You are going to blow it. You are going to screw up. They call it a midlife crisis for a reason. Right, You're going to have a problem. You're going to have an issue. You're going to have a failure. You're going to have a letdown. And so your ability to be able to learn from that and move forward, to move from why God, why God, why God, to what's next God, is everything. So in one respect, you have to hold yourself to the highest standard ever. Right? In the other standard, you have to remember that you're not Jesus and you need him every single day. And you need brothers around you that go, you know what? Let me show you how to get out of that. Let me show you how to walk out of it. And here's what I'm going to say about change. 
Change doesn't happen overnight. And some of you, I don't know who I'm talking to, but some of you, you have a legalistic opinion and attitude about sin. Okay, men, especially Christian men, should not be prudes about sin. I used to have soldiers come to me, and they're just like shameful, and you know, I just had to look at them and go, bro, you're not going to tell me anything I haven't heard before. And then they open their mouth. I'm like, well, I've heard that before. But anyways, <laughs> y'all are crazy. <laughs> y'all are crazy. I love you anyways, but y'all are crazy. <laughs> and I hear their story, and I sit here and go, okay, well, you can unscramble the past. just like You can't change the past just like you can unscramble eggs. So what are we going to do move forward? At some level, this constant fear and shame, that's not from God. On the flip side, you can't just pretend that sin doesn't matter and that you didn't hurt people. It does matter, but you have to look forward. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. I promise you that whatever you're facing wasn't as bad as the cross. The joy set before him, what is that? That's the future. He knew. He saw every one of you. For the joy set before him, he went through it. You have to go through it. You have to go through the sin. You have to go through the mire. You have to, you have, you have to push through that stuff. Philippians 4, 3, 13. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Here's what he said. Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, meaning I'm not there yet. I'm still trying, but I am not there yet. Sometimes I lose my temper. Sometimes I'm a little more mouthy than I should be. Sometimes I'm not exactly what people around me think I should be. Look what he says. But the one thing I do, for forgetting those things that are behind, and I reach forward to those things which are ahead, I press, I love that, press. I press. It's where we get pressure from. You feel like you got some pressure on you? Good. Pressure makes diamonds. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I discipline my body like an athlete. I love this. Training it to do what it should. You're born again as a believer. He's talking to the church. These are saved men and women. He says, I discipline my body, not like the world, but, but like the believer, I, I train it to do what it should now that my spirit's in charge. I train it to do what it should. You know, you can train and reframe your entire life. The things that have happened to you, the things that have been done to you, the things you can control and the things you couldn't control. God can redeem those things. Next, resist. I love that. Fight hell. Fight like hell. I like that too. But you probably shouldn't fight like that. Resist. Resist. You have to fight. 2 Corinthians 10.3, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. James 4.7, so humble yourselves before God. Remember, there is a God and I am not him. Everyone say, I am not God. Am not God. Um, changes your life every time you, you want an answer. Just, God, I'm not you. Give me one. Look what he says. Resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Many of us, we don't resist. You have to resist. You have to resist. Next, why? You. Everyone say me. me. Hunger. Understanding. No excuses. Growth. Resistance. And then ultimately, ultimately, this is important, ultimately, focus on you. Focus on you. And I, I wish I would have said, instead of take responsibility, I would have put radical responsibility. Radical responsibility. I say, it, I say it personally for this. I never ask permission to take responsibility, ever. I see something, I deal with it. I meet the problem where they meet me. I see something down, I pick it up. You can watch me. There's people laughing at me on the side. I'm always fixing stuff over here. For whatever reason, the, the antibacterial things always like knock down when I, whatever. I just can't handle that. I just walk up and just make sure it's, the same distance as it is from the other side, which it's not. But anyways, <laughs> but you see, what I'm care, care about the details. Take responsibility for your life. There's nothing that draws God more towards the man who will say, "Here I am, Lord, send me." I love that. He said, "Here I am, Lord, show me who to ask." Did he, did he say that? No. Samuel said, "Speak, Lord, for I'm here. I'm going to listen." Remember the word "listen" in Hebrew is "listen and obey." I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Take radical responsibility. Matthew 7, 5. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll be able to see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Not getting through to your friend? Chances are there's a reason for that. Work on you.
focus on you. Others will ask you, like that young man did to me. He asked me. He watched me for three years. Our church has doubled in the last three years, by the way. Doubled. Over doubled. I just looked at the numbers. I was like, I don't really care about that too much, but I look every now and then. Doubled. Couldn't believe it. More churches are closing down all around the nation, all around the nation closing down, and our church doubled in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So, so yeah, thank you. Keep that up there. So, so this young man seeing that, and he goes, hey, man, what would you tell me? Because I'm going to whoop your butt. I love it. He, this is what he was asking me for. Tell me what you wish you would have known at 19 so that when I'm half your age, I'm going to be better than you. I love it. That's what he was really asking. And I, and I, just, I just sit here and go, man, let me tell you. Did you know there's older men that love that? Some of you younger men in here, find an older man. They'll give it away to you. And if they won't, move on. Find someone who does. They will. They'll be like, okay, I'll tell you. What, I, what took me 10 years, I hope it takes you five. Here's what I wouldn't do. Ask somebody. It's important. I have a few other things, but I'll save it for later. I have some things that we're doing as a church that I want to just prepare you for. Um, I really believe in Ephesians 4.11. I'm not going to read it. I want you to keep this up here for me if you can. Um, our job is to equip you. It just is. And one of the things that has been on my heart this year, and really all year, but it's kind of coalescing in December, is what can we do to really equip men? The first thing we're doing is we've created a men's leadership team that's helping us with different initiatives and different things. But I want to be specific about a few things in 2024 you're going to be hearing about. The first one is something I'm pretty excited about. It's called the Be a Man Challenge. The Be a Man Challenge is a 12-week challenge. You can throw that slide up. I know I told you to leave it there, but throw that slide up. Um, this is a 12-week challenge, and it is difficult. I am in my fourth week, and I cannot wait for the next two months when I'm done. Um, but it's a challenge. You know, one of the things that we don't do often enough is hard things. One of the best things you can do is learn to do a hard thing. I never wait till January to do a hard thing. I always do it before Thanksgiving. You know why? Because I want to eat the entire Thanksgiving table. And I know it's coming, and I know I'm going to feel like crap afterwards. So guess what I do? I start my challenge right before. And as a result, well, I've been in the same size of pants most of my life. Make, have a challenge. For some of you, you're drinking too much. You know, the Bible doesn't say alcohol is a sin. Being drunk is. Relying on it every single day is. Well, actually, I don't even know if that is. It's not wise. Drunkenness is clear. But, I mean, if you have to go, to, go home and your life's so stressed out, before you open up your Bible, you take a shot of whiskey or, or a glass of wine or, you know, for some of you more feminine men, a mimosa or something. You know, my, <laughs> my point is it's, prob it's probably not a good idea. You know, what's the downside to saying, hey, for 12 weeks I'm not going to drink? Maybe you're smoking a cigar every day. Hey, I like cigars, but every day ain't good for you. <laughs> you're going to die a lot sooner. Breathe a little bit. Take 12 weeks off. What, what's the big deal about You know what's challenging about yourself physically? Do an extra workout. I did 75 hard. This is kind of built off of that concept with some spiritual disciplines put in there. But it changed my life. I was like, this is awesome. I was so glad when it was over. But, but it was awesome. I, I, you know what I did? I left saying, I could do that. You know what? That doesn't have to have a grip on me. For some of you, it might be pornography. It might be screen time. That's in here. Get off social media. Just turn it off. By the way, do it soon. It's about to get crazy. You're going to need to have your head on straight. You know, take some time to hear God for you. Does that make sense? We're going to be doing this. As a matter of fact, if you want to do it, uh, there's all kinds of resources we have. Um, anything that, I, I think we have a lot of resources. Yeah, we have. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the first book. It's a great book from Josh Hawley. Uh, he's a, I don't know, some politician guy. He's a believer, though, in uh, Missouri. I love the book. I read it earlier this year. We also have some different things uh, that are part of the challenge, some different templates that we have. Uh, they're all online. Here's what I would challenge you to do. If you want to do that, there's going to be a, a booth right back here. Uh, Jake, stand up. Jake, are you here? Yeah, give it up for Jake, man. Didn't Jake, didn't Jake do a good job? Um, we're, 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 we're not going to let anybody uh, sign up today, but we will have this set up every Wednesday and every Forged event. Okay, so we'll have this set up on Wednesday nights. You'll check me on that. You'll help me keep my promise. Thank you, Jake. Uh, every Wednesday night, we'll have it back there. I want you to actually think about it and count the cost. Okay, because if you miss one thing one time, you start over. So I want you to really think about it, pray about it, count the cost. Jake will have some more information about that. That's going to be up uh, anytime you'd like to, to start it. We also are going to be launching a 12-week discipleship course for men called Patriarch. Uh, yes, I did pick that word. We are redeeming that word. That is a biblical word and a good one. Uh, we're going to talk to sons, husbands, and fathers. It's going to be a great 12-week uh, course for boys and men. Uh, I, I wanted to say boys to men, but I, I just couldn't. <laughs> I, I just couldn't. I wanted to. I just, I just couldn't. Uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so that's going to be launching in February. Uh, be thinking uh, about making space and time for that. That will be an in-person course.
course uh, that our team does. It's going to be an incredible, incredible uh, addition to our discipleship courses. And then we also have a men's event coming up called Beast Feast. I want to tell you a little bit. Yeah, you should clap. Um, the team is putting together all kinds of things. If you own a business, you'd like to get involved, you'd like to take over a certain part, it is going to be a huge community event. I want to bring men, and we are going to invite their families and, and people in. I think it's going to be a great time uh, for, us to, for us to connect with the community. Um, but I also, I also this week, I, I killed a couple does at the ranch, so they're donating some does. So I'm going to bring some does. Uh, we've got some ducks, some quail. If you guys have some exotic stuff, uh, Pastor Luis our uh, vintage and Espanol pastor, he can make a ram taste good. So any of that that you have, uh, we, can, we can get it up and, and take care of that. That's going to be really good. Something else that I want to tell you before we pray and close out is uh, this year we're also focusing in January, really from New Year's all the way through January, uh, on the year of the Bible. I really, really believe that as people of his book, if we can just, if we can Lean in and hear his word and allow it to transform our life. He's going to tell us everything that we need to do. We're going to provide a lot of different resources. One of those resources is going to be an Honest to God uh, devotional. I wrote that a couple years ago, but we've recently added a Listen Daily 365 where you can actually listen along with it. All the Bible readings, that was kind of difficult to go through the devotional. Uh, so there's a podcast there. There's also um, a discipleship course on just foundations of faith. For some of you who are just getting started in your faith, uh, this is, I wrote um, a better uh, book and also a discipleship course. We're going to make that available online so you can take it. Something I'm really, really excited about um, is uh, this is actually a planner that we made uh, several, actually five or six years ago now called Better Planner. Uh, for those of you who have a hard time keeping track of your life, that Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Everything else comes from the devil. Okay, here's what that means. As a man, you have to get really good at saying yes and really good at saying no. You don't have to be a jerk, by the way. You can learn to say no, and they thank you for it. Uh, no, not me, but here's an alternative. And so we actually walk through. I have a, a life, kind of a life planning system here and a quarterly planner that we walk through. We're going to be making that available. We've upgraded some different things and some tutorials. We're going to do that. And then we're also going to have a 2024 prayer and fasting guide. We will be doing a fast in January. Um, all of this stuff is going to be going live at all of our locations, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. And so I want to just put that up there. Here's, here's why I'm telling you all of this stuff coming up. Listen, if you wait to make a plan till January, you're going to fail. I know what comes in January. I've done it. I've done it. I've watched people do it. 90 plus percent of New Year's resolutions fail. And I, I, I really believe it's because they didn't start earlier. Start earlier. Make a plan. Do it when it's hard. Make sure that you're scheduling out your time and your life to be able to make time to be with other believers, to study his word. I'm really, really excited about that challenge as well. I want to encourage you guys, make sure you go by and take a look at it. I believe it's going to be a great start uh, to a new year. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. God, I thank you so much for everything you're doing in our church, everything you're doing uh, with our men. Um, I, it's unbelievable as I look across this room, and I, I just see men that are engaged in building all of our locations. They're faithful. They show up. They're getting to know each other. They're growing. I, I just pray, Father, for every... Matter of fact, every man in here, put your palms up. But just put your palms up while we're praying. God, I, God, we just surrender 2024 to you. God, I, I, we, we pray, Jesus, that you, you show us the lessons we needed to learn this year. And Father, you give us the vision for what you want to do in and through us personally, through our families, our work, and our church, for our community. God, we pray that if there's anything you would have us take responsibility for, we say yes and amen. Father, here we are. Send us. Lord, don't send anyone else. Send us. We promise to put you first. We promise to repent when we miss it. We promise to never lose sight that you are good and that if we don't quit, we can't lose. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.